Independent journalist Carl Meyer fell in love with the Connecticut River long ago, but it took him decades to understand how broken its ecosystem has been in the Bay State since 1972. New England's Great River has been pillaged and literally pulled into reverse for miles at times via massive industrial siphoning that kills hundreds of millions of fish and aquatic animals annually. Today, profits from its daily suctioning benefit a Canadian venture capital firm using the state of Delaware for their tax haven. Today, we will hear why federal and state bureaucracies have failed to enforce landmark environmental laws on the Connecticut and why no one holds their feet to the fire. Carl Meyer's past includes work for both Northeast Utilities and the Connecticut River Watershed Council. His writing appears regularly in the Recorder, the Daily Hampshire Gazette, the Vermont Digger, as well as in his blog, uh, which we will put in the link to this, uh, but we will put in the description, Carl Meyer writing blog dot carlmeyerwriting.com slash blog. And uh, we greatly appreciate his participation in this series. Carl, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thanks for the nice introduction, Ty. And great to be here at the Wilbraham Public Library. So thank you and thanks there's some people in the audience here and um, there are a few things to peruse uh, on your way out. Um, some banners that are shown up at, uh, at ecosystem rallies for the Connecticut River, some writing from uh, the last year or so that, uh, that has appeared in local and you know, regional papers. Um, if I were to give a, give a little bit of my own introduction, I, I just wanna say, I, I, I I don't have any particular um, political connection to any of uh, of the people or this this forum, but I did meet Will and Ty. They came uh, on a program that I presented on the Connecticut River last spring um, at a place called the Rock Dam, which was basically the Connecticut River, uh, where the federally endangered short-nosed sturgeon um, tries to spawn each year. Um, but I will say that we have some in interconnections with the themes that are being presented here um, because, and most of, the, most of what I'm gonna be talking about is upstream of here on the Connecticut River, but um, between the Turnus Falls Dam and the Vernon Dam in Vermont is 20 miles of river that is virtually now controlled by venture capital firm, public sector pension investments known as First Light. And their main um, source of revenue is something called the Northfield Mountain Pub Storage Station, uh, which was put in place in 1972 and virtually is a heart stopping killer that, that literally eats uh, the Connecticut River's resident and migratory fish um, by the hundreds of millions annually. Um, if we're talking about um, the only studies that have ever been successful in this plant, and I, I hope, I guess my, my hope, we have a lot of time to talk, I'm told, but my, my hope here is to at least give you a sense of what a broken ecosystem is and, and what happens when a, a, a venture capital firm from Canada is planning on controlling it for the next 50 years because we are right in the middle of what's called the federal relicensing of this power plant. And the last license lasted from 1972 and it is up this, well, actually was up in 2018. So that they're actually producing their secondhand net loss power for the last three and a half years on house money. But let me give you a sense of what this machine does called the Northfield Mountain Pub Storage Station. Uh, it was put in place virtually at the same time that Vermont Yankee nuclear plant came online. Uh, Vermont Yankee was, I believe, a 600 megawatt nuclear plant, came online in 1972. And there was this great scheme from the Western Mass Electric Company, Northeast Utilities, now known as Eversource. And if you look under Eversource, they actually are Columbia Gas. They are, uh, they are, they're an aquatic water company. They have 42 companies that are LLCs underneath their name. So they're a, they're a mega company and they, they sort of run the grid still. Anyway, Northfield Mountain was hacked out of the top of a mountain in Northfield, a 4 billion gallon reservoir. 
there are these mile long tubes that go from the top of that mountain directly into the Connecticut River. And between the 20 miles of Turner's Falls Dam and Vernon Dam is what they consider their lower reservoir. They don't even call it a river. And how the deal works to make money, are we doing okay? Am I, am I like banging things around? Perfect. All right. Uh, how, how the deal works was they were gonna take the excess power from nuclear plants, which goes on ad infinitum. You can't just flip a switch and turn off a nuclear plant. They were gonna get the cheap electricity off of Vermont Yankee that nobody was using. And that still happens daily with nuclear plants today, the ones that are still operating. And they would take that and pump the water out of their lower reservoir, the 20 miles of the thing that we call the Connecticut River, up to the top of that mountain at 15,000 cubic feet per second. Imagine one cubic feet is, is, a, is a milk crate, all right? Or imagine 15,000 of those or 15,000 cubic feet is actually an eight bedroom mansion, okay? With a big dining hall, study, library. Okay, 15,000 feet per second, okay? 60 a minute. Now go to an hour, keep, keep multiplying. Go to four hours. Everything that goes up those tubes is dead. From the tiniest fish egg to full, full size American eels, um, 25, 26 species, two dozen species of, of migratory and resident fish live in that section of the river alone. Um, our migrants, the important fish that are supposed to be ours, this is the public's river. Uh, our American shad is, is one of the key operating principles of the, the Connecticut River. They used to feed everybody from the Abenaki to the Pecumtuck to the Agawam down here. That was the breadbasket of the river. The only study that was somewhat successful, it's a modeling study done by the Massachusetts Division of Fish and Wildlife and US Fish and Wildlife Service um, about five years back, estimated just for American shad alone, which are a federal trust species, right? They, they belong to us. They're supposed to be protected by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, National Marine Fisheries, Mass Division of Fish and Wildlife. Well, their estimation is that Northfield, American shad alone, juvenile running shad alone, coming downstream from Vermont, New Hampshire, that section of river that's in Massachusetts. It's a three state section of river that's controlled now by a Canadian corporation. Two million baby shad will get sucked up that thing and never and be lost again. Nobody knows, you know. Um, and 10 million uh, early life stage and uh, um, eggs. That's one species, right? And that's that's with just very few American shad making it up the river. The new Fish and Wildlife Service plan, and they blew this 50 years ago, is they want to move, they finally want to move 400,000 fish past Turner's Falls. So those fish will go up to Vermont, New Hampshire and spawn in the spring. And then when they turn around to come back down, they're going to get eaten by First Light, Cat, First Light PSP Investments, which uh, I know Will and Ty have a handout that I, I did not write, but we dovetail pretty well on this because I used to, uh, um, Disclosure on this, I used to work for the Connecticut River Watershed Council. I think we said that. I also worked at the Recreation Center at Northfield Mountain. And for a while, I was on the safety committee in that plant. So I have some stink on me from a few different places. And, I, and you're, you're going to sort of understand why through this talk that I am not a fan of the Watershed Council. I think they've been an abject failure for the 69 years they've been around. That they're, that they're a four state watershed now called conservancy organization without a single lawyer on a US Fish and Wildlife Refuge, which is the S.O. Conti National Fish and Wildlife Refuge. And I don't know if you folks were around with this, but this is a watershed wide. We are, we are virtually in it right now. Um, and it is only one of two refuges, US wild, Fish and Wildlife Refuges that has fish in its title. 
So let me drop back to, let's do a quick history of coming up the river from ancient times. Let's do a, a very fast history of the Connecticut River and some of the big uh, historic events. I think one of the biggest ones uh, was sort of a societal failure in the clash uh, between Native American tribes and, and the colonists. And we, we basically, um, the massacre at Turner's Falls was, was sort of a real cultural divide. There were Nipmuc, Narragansett, Pecumtuck, uh, Norwatuck, probably Agawam from Springfield, Abenaki. Um, we took their land, but there was this horrible massacre that, that, it, that occurred on May 19th, 1676, when the Native Americans were, had sort of battled back. They were trying for their last bit of sovereignty on the Connecticut River. I could get off on long tangents on this. Anyway, there was, there was a, a horrible massacre at the site that is Turner's Falls, where the dam is today. So there seems to be sort of a, an ugly legacy hold over there. 1798. The first dam to cross the Connecticut River completely, the first main, full main stem dam, was built at Turner's Falls. That essentially cut off, it's a 410 mile river, it cut off the Connecticut River migration route at mile 122. Okay, Vernon Dam goes up to mile 142. So that's your 20 miles. So that 1798, Within about 11, 12 years, all the salmon, all the salmon that we used to hear about and we still hear about on the Connecticut River were extirpated. And the interesting part about this is then we, in uh, 1967 and for the last 50 some odd years, we turned around and tried to, tried to recreate an extinct salmon species at the southernmost river on the very southernmost edge of, of its territory in an age where climate was already happening. All right, so, so, so 1798, so you, now you're moving downstream, right? So you have no more river above Turner's Falls. 1798, the river's blocked. 1848-49, Holyoke Dam gets built. The first one washes away. This is, we're getting in your neighborhood now, a few people from Wilbraham. First one washes away, they rebuild it the next year. So, so then you have 86 miles of the river left, right? But the shad are still coming up. The shad are still in the river. All along through the colonial age to the beginning of the industrial age, people, farmers, small country, uh, country towns are upset because the fish that used to feed them, the sustenance in the spring were the American shad, herring, a few salmon way back in the day, okay? But they were a, a, a small but significant component of the run, but it was the shad that were feeding people. So there were lawsuits and the lawsuits get started to, to, to sort of uh, gain ground. Ultimately, right, uh, I don't know, due west of here and a little bit north, there was a, a major lawsuit that hit the Supreme Court. It was called Holio Company versus Lyman. And the finding of that, which is kind of stare decisis uh, Supreme Court law, was that owners of dams on the Connecticut River, any US river, are legally bound to pass migratory fish upstream, safely upstream and down of their facilities. 1872, let's go a hundred years above that. 1972, you install the Northfield Mountain Pub Storage Station, which literally eats the fish that we're trying to restore on the Connecticut River. And that's where we are today, 49 years later. And my history with this river aside from my love of it has been, if you go to my website, I guess it's been up for about 11 or 12 years now. And if you go to anything, you go to Carl Meyer, comma river, you do a little sleuthing about me, my website, the whole thing, basically it says one thing, the river is broken 
and nobody's taking responsibility. And that's where we are today on the Connecticut River.